Hello, Flat Earth researchers, debaters and debunkers. How on earth is it possible to see people apparently floating weightless in space on the ISS? Flat Earthers are accused of having the ridiculous notion that it's somehow possible to create a weightless environment somewhere on Earth rather than having to have people spinning around orbiting the Earth at thousands of miles an hour. One question to ask is why is the ISS a tube? Well, here we have a frog levitating in a magnetic field in a tube and this is called diamagnetic levitation and it was first discovered in 1846 by Michael Faraday and since then back in the 1970s these experiments were done on organic objects including uh, locusts and strawberries with no ill effects whatsoever uh, we even have a tomato being levitated in this field and this is because because the objects have a high water content and we can see what happens to water there in this diamagnetic experiment. A quick look through the history of diamagnetism uh, reveals some interesting information about how this uh, particular topic or subject of research has remained very much on the fringes of mainstream science and it was difficult uh, for mainstream science to accept uh, even as late as the 1990s. Uh, here we have this paper, uh, John Tyndall and the early history of diamagnetism and if we go down here we can see that the period of 10 years following Michael Faraday's discovery of diamagnetism in late 1845 was a critical one for the development of the understanding of magnetism and for Faraday's emerging field theory. John Tyndall played a significant role in this period which has not been properly recognized. And we go down here where it says uh, the effects uh, to be described require magnetic apparatus of great power and under perfect command, so stated Faraday in his paper read before the Royal Society on the 20th of November 1845, announcing the discovery he had made on the 4th of November of a new but very weak magnetic property of matter. Faraday had demonstrated in September with his heavy glass that a magnetic force could cause the rotation of polarized light traveling through the glass. It was important to him to show that magnetism was a universal property of matter. And he now examined the effect of magnetic force directly on the glass and then on many other materials by suspending the chosen material between or close to the poles of a powerful magnet. This resulted always in a repulsion from the poles, or from a single pole, remarkably like a case of weak electrostatic repulsion, so that a bar of the material placed between the poles would set at right angles to the line joining the poles. Whereas a normal magnetic substance, which we now call paramagnetic, would be attracted and set in line with the poles. The videos of the frog and other things levitating were done in the 1990s by this gentleman, Andre Guim. And uh, there are some interesting comments in this book about him called The Deliberate Amateur. He was considered a bit of a maverick scientist and it was on a Friday night session with friends that he found out about uh, the levitating frog. Uh, here, Guim won the Nobel in Physics in 2000 for levitating a live frog with magnets. In my experience, if people don't have a sense of humor, they are usually not very good scientists either, he said. The image of the flying frog first made the rounds after its publication in the April 1997 issue of Physics World, though many assumed it was an April Fool's Day prank. Most thought that water's magnetism, billions of times weaker than iron, was not strong enough to counter gravity. The demonstration showed its true force. 
Gein became curious about magnetism when he didn't have equipment to continue his experiments while working at Radboud University in Niemgen's High Field Magnetic Laboratory in the Netherlands. So one Friday evening he set the electromagnetic to magnet to maximum power, then poured water straight into the expensive machine. He still can't remember why he behaved so unprofessionally, but he was able to see how descending water got stuck within the vertical bore. Balls of water started floating. They were levitating. He had discovered that a seemingly feeble magnetic response of water could act against Earth's gravitational force. When Geem tells this story, he's not making a self-depreciating aside about a humble detour. He's talking about a part of the direct route he and his colleagues took to isolate graphene itself. What seemed like a late-night lark evolved into what Geem calls the Friday night experiments. On these occasions, Geem's lab works on the crazy things that probably won't pan out at all, but if they do, it would be really surprising. From the start of Geem's career, he has devoted 10% of his lab time to this kind of research. And here's a quote from this maverick scientist that flat earthers should adhere to. The biggest adventure is to move into an area in which you are not an expert, Geem said. Sometimes I joke that I am not interested in doing research, only search. His overall career philosophy is to graze shallow, do work in new, a new field for a few years and then get out. Uh, further down, we have the wisdom of the deliberate amateur is an old idea for artists seen in the freedom that comes in a late style or in the Zen concept of beginner's mind. Experience is what gets you through the door, but experience also closes the door, choreographer Twyla Tharp once said. You tend to rely on that memory and stick with what has worked before. You don't try anything anew without off-road exploration. We have a little way of figuring it out. The amateur's useful wonder is what the expert may not realize she has left behind. It helps us get around what psychologists call the Einstellung effect or the cost of success, the bias that creeps in without our notice and, you can, and can block us from seeing how to do things in different ways. The website for Radboud University, where these uh, levitation experiments were performed in the 1970s, also reveals some interesting information. If we go down here, uh, this is the first observation of magnetic levitation of living organisms, as well as the first images of diamagnetics levitated in a normal room temperature environment. If we disregard the tale about the flying coffin of Muhammad as such evidence, of course, in fact, it is possible to levitate magnetically every material and every living creature on the Earth due to the always present molecular magnetism. The molecular magnetism is very weak, millions of times weaker than ferromagnetism, and usually remains unnoticed in everyday life, thereby producing the wrong impression that materials around us are mainly non-magnetic, but they are all magnetic. It is just that magnetic fields required to levitate all these non-magnetic materials have to be approximately 100 times larger than for the case of, say, superconductors. further down. Uh, the water and the frog are but two examples of magnetic levitation. We have observed plenty of other materials floating in a magnetic field from simple metals, uh, liquids uh, and various polymers to everyday things such as various plants and living creatures, frogs, fish and a mouse. We hope that our photographs will help many, particularly non-physicists, to appreciate the importance of magnetism in the world around us. For instance, it is not always necessary to organize a space mission to study the effects of microgravity. Some experiments, e.g. plants or crystal growth, can be performed inside a magnet instead. 
Importantly, the ability to levitate does not depend on the amount of material involved, uh, and high field magnets can be made to accommodate large objects, animals, or even man. In the case of living organisms, no adverse effects of strong static magnetic fields are known. After all, our frog levitated in fields comparable to those used in commercial in vivo imaging systems, currently up to 10T. The small frog, uh, frog looked comfortable inside the magnet and afterwards happily joined its fellow frogs in a biology department. There is one important aspect in which the diamagnetic levitation differs from any other known way of levitating or floating things. In the case of diamagnetic levitation, the gravitational force is compensated on the level of individual atoms and molecules. This is, in fact, as close as we can probably ever approach the science fiction anti-gravity machine. So there you have it, from frogs to locusts, strawberries, tomatoes, and even human beings. It's possible to levitate all these things at room temperature inside a tube, as long as you have a big enough magnet.